Let me welcome you to the future, to the year 3023, where typos rule the universe. <laughs> we'll see what work they've done before other work they've done. I, I, I hoist them out of the when I fool around with things. But let me begin by thanking you so much for the kind invitation, and, and thank you all for coming. I'm really sorry that you do not have the opportunity to hear my co-author, John Rutherford, who is not able to be here this evening. And I hope at some time in the future you'll have a chance to meet and hear him. Working together on this uh, book was a great deal of work, also a great deal of fun. And John and I have a lot of fun when we make presentations together on the book. So I'm very sorry that he was not able to be here. Shelby's Brigade, December 1862, retreating from the Confederate defeat at the Battle of Prairie Grove, December 7, 1862, a battle that had uh, poised on an ice edge but ended up being absolutely disastrous for the Southern forces. Shelby's Brigade retreating and retreating. John Newman Edwards, however, who served as adjutant to Shelby, had a very positive view of things in his post-war memoir, Shelby and His Men. The brigade retreated to Lewisburg, Arkansas. But according to Shelby, excuse me, Cardi Edwards, they were not dispirited. In fact, he wrote, the brigade had been resting in camp at Lewisburg when a whisper ran through the tents like jarring of a nerve that a march to Missouri was indicated. These merry madcaps had ever a passionate yearning for such desperate forays. Perhaps, post-war, that's the way he remembered it. What's going on? Well, John C. Tallacy Hyman, theater director for the Trans-Mississippi and Defense of Arkansas, had lost the Battle of Prairie Grove and had his supply base raided at Van Buren, Arkansas after the battle. And on December 29, 1862, he sent orders to John Sappington Marmaduke, who was commander of the 4th or Cavalry Division in the Army of the Trans-Mississippi. And his orders simply read, attack the enemy in the flank and rear, or make a demonstration in that way. And he went on to say that Marmaduke had a free hand and need not necessarily communicate further before launching this attack. You see there a map which may not show up terribly well, but I think probably you can see that there's a line of communication running from St. Louis to Rolla, down to Springfield, and on down into Arkansas. This inland transportation corridor was fought over by the northern and southern troops throughout the war. It was the back door to Mississippi, and control of that resulted in the battles of Wilson's Creek, Prairie Grove, at uh, Cane Hill uh, and other places before the Confederates finally solidified their control by capturing Arkansas. What could the Confederates do? Einman had rolled the dice, getting an army up to Prairie Grove, had lost, and now he was in desperate straits. He did the obvious thing, which was to sit, use his cavalry to try and buy time to strike against the enemy's vulnerable line of communication to send troops to cut that line of communication. All the food used by the Union forces attempting to conquer Arkansas came from St. Louis by Rolla, by rail, and then by wagons to Springfield and further south by wagon load by wagon load. It was a very vulnerable line of communication. Marmaduke, who was 29, was a graduate, excuse me, native of Era Rock, he was a West Point graduate, graduating in 1857. Uh, his very uh, laudatory biographer, uh, Thomas O'Flaherty, said, Marmaduke looked like the beau ideal his name denoted. Uh, and he is a very dashing man. In fact, so dashing, I always thought like he looks like he's in the middle of a windstorm, even when he's standing still, <laughs> riding a fast horse. Um, uh, truly, and was con considered a very, very handsome man. He was very experienced. He was a veteran of the Battle at Shiloh, where he really earned a um, generalship. He was appointed to command the 4th, or Cavalry Division, the Trans-Mississippi Army. He fought at Prairie Grove. Uh, and his cavalry division, was, was really mounted infantry. 
Most of his men were armed and equipped with infantry weapons, not cavalry weapons, and could fight dismounted as readily as anything. They had, in fact, fought dismounted at Prairie Grove, forming the right-hand wing of the Southern forces during that particular engagement. Well, he had various forces available to him, and under his direct command to take part in this raid, he had 1,888 1, troopers and two artillery pieces. And those of you here in the audience have a handout which I gave you, uh, which lists the names of all the various commanders. Uh, his target, as I said, was this corridor. The problem, though, was the status of his men. Just before the raid was ordered, before he was ordered to do this, he sent a report to Heinlein describing his command as, quoting him, indifferently armed and equipped, thinly clad, many without shoes. Uh, thinly clad, he was mainly referring to clad for the winter. In fact, most of his men, probably at least 75% of the cavalry division, was wearing captured blue Yankee uniforms. In fact, in some of the preliminaries prior to the Battle of Prairie Grove, Shelby's brigade had gotten in a rare hand-to-hand -hand fight while mounted with Union cavalry. And Shelby wrote that the only way we could tell each other apart is the Confederates were wearing hats and the Yankees were wearing khakis. Everybody was in blue. So this was the war in the Trans-Mississippi. Blue did not mean you were a guerrilla trying to disguise yourself. It meant that Richmond wasn't getting any uniforms all the way out to Missouri and Arkansas. So, but the horses, you can make men do a lot of walking, but the horses, he reported that his horses, this is prior to the raid, before he knows he's going on a raid, but he reports that his horses are worn out by continued and active service, for the most part unshod, very poor, and unfit for any service. So it was really an act of desperation that Heinemann takes this force and sends it up into Missouri. It also says he thinks a great deal of John Sapping and Marmaduke and his soldiers that he thinks they can do so when he knows they are in such poor condition. Uh, Einemann left Lewisburg, excuse me, uh, Marmaduke left Lewisburg on the 31st of December, uh, and most of his men were formed a brigade under Joseph Orville Shelby, uh, whose picture was there earlier. He was a native of little, uh, excuse me, a native of Kentucky, a veteran of the Battle of Wilson's Creek, Pea Ridge, and Prairie Grove. He recruited men in the summer of 1862, which he brought south and joined into a brigade, which after the war, John Newman Edwards would call the Iron Brigade, but which never bore that nickname during the war itself. Uh, Edwards gave a very flattering description of Joe Shelby, who he admired greatly. And he said of Shelby, in his large gray eyes were depths of tenderness and ambition and love and passion were all there. The square, massive lower face, hidden by his thick brown beard, was sometimes hard and pitiless and sometimes softened by the genial smiles breaking out over his features. Extremes met in his disposition and conflicting natures warred within his breast. He was all hilarity and all dignity and discipline. Well, I want to focus on the raid and the experiences. This was a major operation, and two battles were fought, Springfield and Hartville, either one of which could uh, occupy all of our time. So I'm not going to go into all the troop maneuvers of those two battles, and just show you actually selectively from a couple of maps that appear in the book. So I want to focus on the raid, and. Uh, Hope that will tempt you then to go out and buy the book, or perhaps at some time, uh, John and I might come back and talk about either of the battles. Well, according to Edwards, Marmaduke's Iron Brigade held up very well over what Edwards did remember as very demanding circumstances. For the first three days, it was continuous cold, continuous rain, and according to Edwards, the men endured without a murmur. All of the sky was dark and barren as a rainy sea, and the keen northeast wind pierced the thin clothing of the men with icy breath. I think these merry madcaps may have thought Marmaduke was insane. <laughs> John Edwards wrote most of Shelby's reports, by the way, and that's the same language you'll see, you'll see in his reports. No, no other Confederate after action reports read like those written by John Newton Edwards. Uh, but, 
Marmaduke was not alone. Placed under his command further east in Arkansas was Colonel Joseph C. Porter, 20, excuse me, 54, a Kentucky native, a farmer, veteran of the Missouri State Guard. There is no undisputed photograph or image of Porter. Uh, this one, which is very blurry, uh, is one. There's another one uh, where he looks almost Stalin-esque. Um, apparently, he never had his picture taken. In fact, there are very, very few descriptions of him. He was a major recruiter for Southern forces by going up into Arkansas in the summer of 1862, fighting a lot of battles and bringing, uh, well, there's a dispute as to how many men he brought back, but uh, at least several hundred, uh, and causing fits for the Yankees who considered such recruiters really to be no better than guerrillas. Joseph Mudd, who wrote a book uh, about fighting with Porter in northern Missouri, gave us this description of Porter, and it's one of the very few that exists. He says, Colonel Porter was about five feet, 10 inches in height, rather slender. His eyes were blue-gray, countenance most agreeable, and the voice low and musical. He received us courteously and pleasantly. His conversation never drifted away from the commonplace. Porter had 850 men under his command, and the plan was for him to move separately from Arkansas up into Missouri. That would allow the raiders to confuse the Federals about where they were going. It would also allow the, the raiders themselves, by not all being in one place, to do a better job of foraging off the countryside. Uh, and they needed a lot of food, and that's one of the frustrations of studying this in a lot of military history. In the after-action reports, None of the Confederates involved speak about foraging other than the very briefest amount. Uh, it, a horse takes hours of grazing to get enough sustenance to, to supplement its diet. Uh, and these men had no time to spare. They were moving through country with there were very few horses. So we know they had to forage and take food from every place they passed by. They simply could not have survived uh, by doing so. U.S. Army regulations, by the way, pre-war regulations, required 26 pounds of food per horse per day. Now, uh, you could get by with less than that, half of that's supposed to be grain, half fodder, but horses wear out very quickly. So, uh, speed is of the essence, but balance against speed for the raiders is always tiring out their horses. And Porter just barely got into Missouri before he sent 150 of his men back because their forces had broken down. His forces starting out were no better than Marmaduke's. <coughs> Marmaduke was, had carte blanche from Heinz, and he had told Porter to join him at Hartville, Missouri, and they would see what to do when they got there. This would place them near to the federal line of communications and they would decide what to do, join their forces. While en route, however, Marmaduke realized that the garrison in Springfield, Missouri was very weak. He just said he learned from scouts, spies, and other sources. Uh, we don't really know, but it was enough to make him change his plans. He would actually attack Springfield, uh, attack Springfield, hope to capture it, uh, a place where there were valuable supplies, so he sent messengers off to the east to search for Porter to tell him, instead of meeting in Hartville on the 9th, meet me in Springfield, Missouri on the 8th. The messengers never found Porter. Missouri, excuse me, Springfield, I have a map of Springfield in uh, wartime up in a minute, was in fact a very, very rich province. It was a main supply depot for the Union forces uh, wagons, trains constantly came down from Rolla, dropped off supplies. Other wagon trains took them down to Arkansas. Uh, it was a place where horses were rehabilitated. Uh, uh, hundreds, perhaps over a thousand horses were there at this time. Horses which would be a rich prize for the raiders to swap their exhausted horses for fresh ones. Also tons of ammunition, arms, and food to be able to capture Springfield and destroy those supplies would be a major thorn in the federal side and might accomplish what would be the best thing Marmaduke could accomplish, which would be to frighten the federals into shifting a large number of people out of Arkansas and back into Missouri, thus delaying their campaign to 
conquer the state. Uh, Springfield was defended by a combination of regular units and militia. Uh, and on your sheet, I list the different regiments that were there. Two different kinds of militia, and to explain all the different types of militia that existed on the federal side during the Civil War would take all the time we have this evening. Uh, but there were present in, there, in Springfield units called the Missouri State Militia and units called the Enrolled Missouri Militia, which were essentially like the Minutemen of the Revolution. Uh, what matters is there was a militia system upon which uh, Egbert Benson Brown, the man charged with defending Springfield, could call upon. And when he received word that Marmaduke was on the way, he called out the militia in the neighboring counties. He received word because the Federals had placed small outposts all throughout southern and eastern Missouri, acting, today we call them tripwires. There are no telephones, there are no telegraphs information moves at the speed of the horse. So there are all kinds of little garrisons spread out, and their goal was not to stop anybody, but to delay them, and for messengers and couriers to be able to spread the alarm. And that's exactly what happened, so that on the 7th of January, Egbert Benson Brown learned that Marmaduke was approaching from the south, with reports that he had 5,000, 6,000, 20,000, a lot of raiders on the way. Uh, Edward Vincent Brown was a New York native. He was 45. Um, he had been a sailor on a whaler. Uh, he was a former mayor of Toledo, Ohio. At the time, he was a Missouri businessman, and he was a political general. Generals appointed because there simply weren't enough commanders to go around. In this case, the Union got a pretty good bargain. He had directed operations before this sending troops out from Springfield to operate against guerrillas with some success, but he had apparently never himself actually led troops into battle. Uh, so, what he needed was time. Uh, on the morning of January 8th, he had a city that had a lot of resources that could be grabbed and was very, very difficult to defend. The Federals had begun constructing a series of forts, and because I'm not going to go into all the details of the battle, I'm going to uh, ask you to be satisfied with what I had hoped was a less blurry image, which would show with the flags that there are a series of earthworks forts around Springfield. Some of them were still under construction, uh, and the idea, of course, was to use these forts uh, to guard the city. The most important one, labeled Fort Number One, they were just able number four, one, two, three, four, and five, uh, was just north of Springfield, uh, guarding the high ground. If the Confederates got that, they could bombard the city. Springfield was also home to a large number of hospitals. And the hospital post director there was a man named Samuel Melcher. And when the alarm went out, Melcher approached General Brown, with a proposition. Let me go through the hospitals. There are actually at least four, maybe five separate hospitals in Springfield. Let me go through the hospitals and ask every man who feels he can get on his feet to come to defense in this time of emergency. There are plenty of extra weapons stockpiled here in Springfield. Brown, of course, said, yes, go get everyone you can. And approximately 300 people joined this group, which was almost immediately nicknamed the Quinine Brigade, since quinine was the medicine that they gave for fevers and uh, a lot of other things, because you don't know, after all, it might help with anything. Um, what Brown needed was time, and eventually he got that, uh, in part by being very skillful in his defense of Springfield. And unfortunately, we don't have a great deal of information Brown never left an account where he said, I did this because, like many generals, he just gave an account of what he did without saying why he did it, but he took great risks. He needed time, and he sent most of the cavalry forces he had south of Springfield so that when Marmaduke approached, instead of being able to surprise the city, he found the federal cavalry in his front and had to push them slowly, slowly back to Springfield. Uh, that bought time, so eventually, Brown had about 2,000 men to defend Springfield. 
And Marmaduke, remember, had 1,880. If he dismounts his men, one man in four has to serve to hold the horses. Uh, and again, his men were primary mounted infantry. In fact, Brown in his report said Confederate mounted infantry attacked us. Uh, well, the fight at Springfield, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the map. The, spot, the fight at Springfield uh, took a particular pattern in that Marmaduke attacked from the south and his attacks were piecemeal, didn't do a very good job. He seems to have turned direction of the battle mostly over to Joe Shelby for reasons that are not clear. John Newman Edwards actually claimed that Marmaduke's eyesight was very bad, suggesting that's why he did it. But later in the war, Marmaduke fought a duel and killed his opponent. So apparently his eyesight was good, or maybe his courage was just extra good. But the attacks were piecemeal. He attacked from the south and from the west, and it may be that he was trying to draw forces away from the eastern approach to Springfield, which is where Porter would show up if the messengers actually arrived. The Union defense was very well because Brown managed to shift his forces back and forth uh, across Springfield's uh, area in order to meet each of the threats. Uh, among, the among the people defending the post, uh, was Reverend Frederick H. Wines. He was the post chaplain, and he took a position in one of the forts, firing his dragoon revolver, yelling out loud, put your trust in Jesus, boys, and aim low. Everyone was needed to defend. In fact, when the threat moved to what would be the federal right flank, the Reverend moved on to that as he passed a wounded officer. The man said, I see you belong to the church militant, to which the Reverend said, no sir, the church triumphant. And on meeting another wounded officer, the Reverend, after giving him spiritual comfort, said, now Captain, put your trust in Jesus. He will stay with you always. I can't. And he returned to the battle. Wines is actually just one of many examples you can find in their Civil War of fighting parsons, of, of people who took up the musket and the sword, even while they gave spiritual consolation to the troops. The fighting was close. It was sometimes hand to hand. It got almost to the center of the square in Springfield. It is one of the few urban battles in the American Civil War. The fighting got so close that at one point, uh, there was a fight over an artillery piece that the Federals had shifted to their right flank. A fight between Major Samuel Brown of Gilkey's Regiment, one of the Confederate regiments, and Captain John Landis, who was commanding this six-pounder artillery piece. Bowman and uh, Landis shot it out, pistol to pistol, almost at point-blank range. Bowman shot off Landis's shoulder strip, and Landis was mortally wounded. According to some sources, the Southern officer approached the artillery piece saying, surrender! to which the Union officer said, we were here first, you surrender. <laughs> it makes a good story, and they may actually have said that. That artillery piece changed hands several times, uh, and the Confederates eventually captured it. Among the most interesting participants in this particular campaign were the men of Quantrill's Cavalry Company. They were commanded by Lieutenant William H. Gregg, a native of Jackson County, Missouri, who was 25. Uh, William Quantrell was in Richmond. He'd gone to Richmond in order to get a commission as a colonel. Historians disagree as to whether or not he got it. Uh, but his men uh, enlisted in the Trans-Mississippi Army as a regular unit uh, in the late months of 1862. Uh, contrary to what you will read sometimes, they were not enlisted as a partisan unit, but were enlisted as a regular unit, and they were attached in a regular manner to the 4th or Cavalry Division of the Trans-Mississippi Army. And Greg commanded them for the entire time they were with this. Um, they had fought as a regular unit at Cane Hill and Prairie Grove, fighting dismounted. Uh, in this particular campaign, as they approached Springfield, they were given the task of 
threatening the Federals on their left flank, the, the Confederate right. According to a Union soldier who was defending that flank, he said at Quantrill's Inn, commanded by Gregg, they would chase us as close as they dare to our defenses, then stop. They would also make obscene gestures, turning their buttocks towards us and patting them with their hands. Uh, not everything was so amusing, however. I, this is a picture of Springfield that appeared at Parker's Weekly uh, earlier in the war. Um, and for those of you who know Springfield, that would be basically looking from uh, north of uh, Chestnut Expressway and looking south at Springfield. I said, uh, we can laugh at that description of Quantrill's men, but for the women and children in Springfield who were wondering what their fate was going to be, this was no laughing matter. A large number of people just simply skedaddled during the night of January 7th when they learned that the Southerners were approaching. Some of them also took refuge in this house. This is a post-war photograph of a house belonging to Colonel Samuel Shepard, who commanded one of the militia units. Uh, the cupola, if you can see it, the tower, is a post-Civil War addition. Um, and a letter written by a girl only described as Yankee girl, that's how she signed herself in, in the article she wrote. Uh, she described being on the um, other side from where the photograph is taken, watching the battle from there. Uh, this is what she said about watching from the Shepherd home. She says, I was not frightened, I did not cry, but inexpressible anguish came to my heart as I listened to the roar of the cannon. And her main concern is the other women and children gathered there. It says, from the veranda on the second story, I saw the rebels moving in long lines emerging from thickets and underbrush about half a mile distant. I could see distinctly their batteries. Thirty women and children had gathered and sought refuge in the shepherd home. The Yankee girl continues. Some were wringing their hands and crying, Oh, God, spare my husband. Or that cannon. Oh, dear, that shell perhaps will strike him. I was thankful that I had no husband to be used as a target that day. Whichever way I turned, the faces were looking at me, filled with despair and groans from anxious hearts, which only replied uh, silently to my words of comfort. Marmaduke was unable to capture Springfield. At the end of the day, as darkness came, after consulting with his officers and after Porter had not shown up and they had no idea, none of the messengers would return. They decided they would not attempt to attack Springfield any further and would move off to the east to Hartville, the original <coughs> point. Meanwhile, meanwhile, alarms had gone out from Springfield, the major supply center, because there is a telegraph line running up to St. Louis and other places, and so the alarm went out. And strangely, the Confederates in attacking Springfield did not cut the telegraph line until late in the afternoon. Their reason for doing so is not clear. It had been cut earlier, possibly by them, days earlier, and restored, so maybe they thought it wasn't working. But the alarm went out. It went out to all kinds of those little posts that had been placed throughout Missouri. Send help to Springfield. And one of the persons who did so was Brigadier General Henry Fitzwarren at Houston, small outpost east of Hartville. Uh, he commanded a relief force that intended to go to Springfield. They had no idea what had happened there. And again, on your sheet, you have the list of the, the artillery and the cavalry and the infantry troops under his command. Merrill was a name, main native. He was 51. He, was a, he moved to Iowa. He was an Iowa politician. He had no combat experience. Uh, but an admirer said, at six feet tall, the bearded, square-jawed Yankee cut an impressive figure. As he moved his men east along the country roads that would take them towards Springfield, uh, he halted uh, on early on the morning of January 10th uh, at a place where the road crossed what is called Woods Fork of the Gasconade River. And it's up there you know, where you see the A. Uh, this is the approximate location of that ford. 
And confusingly, that fort is also called sometimes just Dry Fork. So Dry Fork is the name, uh, excuse me, uh, Woods, sometimes just called Woods Fork. Uh, Woods Fork is the name of the, of the stream that runs into the Gascony River. He sensibly camped his men in a good place, a good spot to camp, and sent pickets to the far side of the fort. Very sensible thing to do. What he did not know is preceding him not very much earlier were Porter's men who had come to Hartville, they had not found Marmaduke there, passed through Hartville and were going east. They had passed, excuse me, they were going west. They crossed the ford and they were heading towards Springfield when early in the morning of the 10th they ran into Marmaduke and the two forces were together for the first time. Marmaduke turned his men around. They headed back towards Hartville, and they, the excuse me, leading forces of Marmaduke's column ran into those pickets on the far side of Woods Fort, ran into them in the dark, and firing started. Uh, neither side really knew what was going on, and both sides began to feed people into this. A sergeant named uh, Norman Hill wrote a description very shortly after the battle, which I think is one of the most honest comments on how a soldier might feel in combat that you will see. He was a soldier in the 3rd Missouri Cavalry, and he was given the assignment, the men of his company, to go forward in the dark down the country road and see what's there. This is just after midnight on January 11, 1863. Hill wrote, he's writing just a few days after the battle. It may be easy for a brave man to march forward in daylight to meet his foe, whom he can see, but not so easy to grope his way through the woods in utter darkness, feeling, as it were, for the enemy, and expecting every moment to be shot by an unseen foe with no opportunity for self-defense. The order simply means, go ahead until they shoot you, and then we shall know where they are. <laughs> Inconclusive fighting occurred from, well, actually, quite a different variation in, in different people saying when the contact occurred, but from uh, at least around midnight until dawn, as both sides fed men into this battle, one of the few extensive, well, the small scale fights in the darkness during the Civil War. And as you might uh, imagine, there are some accounts of friendly fire casualties. It was an inconclusive fight, and as dawn approached, Marmaduke decided that the thing to do was to simply skip around this force. Uh, he still wanted to get to Hartville, uh, and he took an alternative route, which you can see, I think, there, uh, that you can go one route directly to Hartville and the other loops down, it's called the Old Springfield Road. So he left some of his forces simply to keep the Federals there at Wood Fort busy while he started the rest of his forces down towards Springfield. Uh, shortly after dawn, the men he'd left behind started pulling out. They didn't pull out quick enough and the Federals were very aggressive and captured uh, several dozen of them. They followed Marmaduke down the road until he realized, wait a minute, he's got a longer way to go, but instead of chasing him, we need to turn around and take the short route back to Hartville. And it turned out to be quite a race. The Federals won, just barely. They won by taking the high ground. As I said, this is one of several maps that you can find in the book. Uh, and what it shows here is the position of Union troops on a hill overlooking Hart Hill, which is schematically drawn there with the courthouse in the center, uh, with Shelby's men in battle and Porter's men in column. So what's going on? Uh, as I said, it was a close run thing. Sergeant Hill recalled a brief mounted action just west of Hart Hill. In other words, trying to seize that high ground. Uh, and he wrote, in a few moments, we dashed into the village, Hartville, we dashed into the village from the west. At the same time, the rebel cavalry entered from the south, and instantly there was a sharp cavalry fight in the streets. 
There was a flashing of sabers, the sharp ring of carbine and revolver, and the shouts of combatants who, combatants who became very much mixed. And then mutual separation. Interestingly, Hill is the only source recording this mounted clash. Neither, uh, no union or other union sources and no Confederate sources report this, which is an example of the dilemma historians face. Uh, Hill, who wrote a number of things during the war, which we can check, seems to have been very accurate and, as I said, very honest about how dangerous it was to be a soldier. Um, so did this actually take place? Uh, I think probably, but it was probably smaller and so insignificant that neither of the commanders on each side bothered to include it in their report. Well, the Confederates made three inconclusive charges and they were stopped by Merrill's men. Merrill was greatly outnumbered. He had an advantage, though, in terrain. Uh, and the map there, what you could see if you could put everything on it, is that this hill is covered with a lot of low brush. And what Merrill did very daringly was spread his line out very thin, not the usual double ranks that the Union and uh, Confederates usually fight in, but a single rank with several uh, feet between each man, keeping crouched down low and delivering fire steadily, uh, and not giving away that they actually have a small force. The Confederates made three charges and failed to overwhelm a force they outnumbered more than three to one. How could this be? One reason is clearly the exhausted state of the men, and both Marmaduke and Shelby write about this. The, the men were just exhausted. They dismounted to attack, and they were just exhausted. The other thing they don't mention, but certainly had to be a factor, was ammunition. The Confederates had captured no ammunition en route that we know of. We don't know how many rounds per man they had during the raid. But even if each soldier had carried uh, 60 or 80 rounds, you don't want to overload your horse too much or you won't be able to be a fast, slick raider. Uh, it does not take long at all to shoot that up. It's likely that Shelby's men had expended most of their ammunition during the fighting at Springfield. Whether there was any redistribution did Porter give away any of his ammo, we don't know. But the real crisis of the battle, though, came when Porter, who was bringing up the tail, arrived and initially took up a position that would allow him to simply roll up Merrill's line. He was on the federal right flank and had nothing else happen, he could have just roll him up and it would have been a complete Confederate victory. But Marmaduke had placed some of his artillery outside of town on a ridge that doesn't show up on this map. And apparently, one of the officers there saw movement in the rear of the Union troops and believed that the Union were retreating, that they were moving up towards the road that led to Lebanon. Therefore, Porter's orders were countermanded. Instead of attacking in line, his men reformed in column, and he went up the road where he came close to the Union left flank, which opened fire on him and just devastated Porter's men. Uh, he had a great deal of trouble even uh, uh, managing to save his artillery. Shelby wrote, the brigade received a terrible and well-directed fire. The men stood its fury well. And it was not until the tornado had passed that they did begin to waver. Some fell back, it is true. Some stood firm and others crouched behind obstacles that sheltered them. One reason also that the Federals were able to prevail is the artillery they bought with them was commanded by a very aggressive lieutenant named William Walsmith, or Walschmidt, who initially had his artillery on high ground, but then moved it down to almost point blank range in artillery terms to fire on Shelby's men. And according to some observers, once he got to the Battle of the Hill, he said, come on you. And then this account is a blank line because they don't use words. So, uh, well, not all of them. So I said, so come on you bleep until I will give you hell with grape shot. The Confederates returned fire, however, with their artillery, and one of their shells shot both arms off of one of the men manning Walsh's guns. Uh, Walsh fired at snipers who had taken uh, cover in the Wright County Courthouse. 
Uh, Lorenzo uh, Boyles, who was the chaplain at the 21st Iowa, recalled this, uh, our two cannon riddled them courthouse. The shell smashed into the courthouse and burst inside while the men tumbled out of the windows above and below. Well, uh, Porter explained, I found the enemy formed in the brush just above the town, 50 yards from my command. I ordered my men to dismount, but the enemy poured upon us such a heavy volley of musketry that my command was compelled to fall back, somewhat in disorder. I being at the same time wounded in the leg and hand. Actually, Porter was mortally wounded. He did leave long enough to write a report. Unable to deal with this force, Marmaduke pulled back, believing he was the victor in this battle because he thought he had managed to run into a superior Union force, move around it, bloody its nose, and escape back to Arkansas never knowing that Merrill had a small force. Merrill, of course, believed that he had been the victor at Hartville. Uh, Marmaduke, in his report, said uh, uh, about after the battle, I established a hospital. I established a hospital, leaving servants and attendants sufficient to care for the dead and wounded, Confederate and Federal. A Union officer, writing shortly after it, said the rebels sent in a flag of truce the next morning with a party to take care of their wounded and bury the dead, the number of which I think will amount to 200. Well, a gross exaggeration, as you can see from your account, uh, only a few dozen men were actually killed. A surgeon named Lucas Benham, a Union surgeon, a federal surgeon, and a small detachment of fellow Iowans joined others who were treating the wounded on both sides. Every building in Hartville became a hospital. There was not enough space to meet all the needs. The Iowans turned nurses uh, could do nothing more for those who were left outside than cover them with leaves against the cold night. It does not take a battle the size of Gettysburg to bring home the inhumanity of man against man. Uh, we did not dare to build fire, said one unit we were obliged to cover the enemy wounded with leaves. Uh, among the killed was Emmett McDonald, a prominent, prominent Southern officer. Uh, there's some mythology about McDonald. According to some stories, he had vowed he would not cut his hair until the Confederacy won its independence. Uh, the trouble is there are pre-war photographs that show long, uh, short of hair just as long. He was so well known, however, that a Union soldier, uh, uh, McDonald was killed, cut a lock of his hair and sent it off to his home folks as a token of a commander uh, they were glad to get rid of by the Adani, but whom they also respected. Well, was it, to, to close here, was it a, a success or a failure? Marmaduke's raiders, uh, as I said, were really mounted infantry, and all of them possessed long arms, and they attacked mostly in the linear fashion. Uh, Marmaduke did indeed panic the Federals into shifting tens of thousands of men from Arkansas back into Missouri, uh, thus accomplishing the raid's major mission. But he failed to capture Springfield. Uh, it's true he was outnumbered. Traditionally, an attacker wants three to one superior odds, and he had fewer men than the defenders. His ammunition, of course, was very limited. But he was not a good tactician. He attacked piecemeal. Uh, Brown was the superior tactician moving his forces around to meet all of the threats. Marmaduke also failed at Parkville. His men were exhausted. There again, he made piecemeal attacks. Uh, the legacy. This is it. Marmaduke came back to Arkansas, convinced he'd been a success, gave a glowing report of how far his men had traveled and how they'd done it in terrible weather, as indeed they had, greatly exaggerating the amount of damage and property he had destroyed and the number of people he had killed and wounded to the enemy. And you can see, and I'm going to read off the sheet, but you have a list there, Hartville and Springfield combined. Oh, this is hardly Gettysburg. But it doesn't take a Gettysburg for it to be the Civil War for the people who participated 
And for those who rode with Marmaduke, who rode with Porter and Shelby or Pondrell's men, for those who defended Springfield gallantly, for those who fought at Hartville against such great numbers, this was the Civil War to them. Several months after the Raiders had returned back to Arkansas, a Confederate cavalryman named James W. Ferris wrote home to his kinfolks. He said, I seat myself to inform you that I am well at present, hoping that these lines may find you all well and doing well. We was up as far as Springfield, but we were not strong enough and we could not go further north. We gave them thunder, though, while we was up there. Thank you.